Well, everyone, welcome back to a very exciting episode of the Storybox podcast. Today, my friends, I'm delighted to welcome someone who many of you may know or have heard of. And if you haven't, why haven't you? Honestly, she is a real icon, in my opinion, that is. And I think her story is really going to wake a lot of you up and challenge you and really inspire you as well. Her name is Rebecca King Cruz. Yes, my friends, I have the absolute pleasure and honor of having her on my show today. Now, Rebecca, instead of me gushing about all the wonderful things that you have done over the course of your life, I thought it would be best for you to actually say it yourself and explain who you are and what you actually do. So please, Rebecca, can you take it away for everyone? Well, uh, I'm a little older than you, Jay, so... Uh, I probably have a lot to say about what I've done in life in terms of the years. Um, But what I say mostly is that I'm a mom and a wife. Uh, I have an amazing husband who's a world respected actor. Um, His name is Terry Crews. And we have been married since 1989. Uh, We are college sweethearts. We have five children and one granddaughter together. And in the process of the 34 years we've been married, Um, we've had an opportunity to do all kinds of fun things. We've done some TV together. Um, I broke into television actually doing reality, which was something I swore I would never, ever do. Um, My background is in theater. So I grew up studying music and dance and went to school for musical theater at um, Western Michigan University where Terry went to play football. So we didn't know each other prior to that. And, um, We met through a mutual friend um, who brought him to my church where I was doing music at the church. And that kind of began a whole life change for me um, that took me on this journey uh, where uh, we moved to L.A. after he played the NFL. And then we once we were in L.A., we began to pursue entertainment. And so um, that's been a blessing for us. Very happy that my husband is still working in entertainment. It's his 25th year of acting, hosting, being fun and crazy for the masses. And he's very thankful to get to do something so fun uh, for a living. And in that process, after my kids got older, I began to pursue some of my own dreams and um, put music out. Uh, I have music out on um, streaming services under uh, my pseudonym, which is Regina Madre. So I'm actually putting out some new music in October. So keep your eyes peeled for new music from Regina Madre um, and have some music videos out there on YouTube. I um, did some radio, actually radio play with a couple of my singles, did well in the urban charts here in the U.S. And um, on top of music, I also launched a clothing line in 2020, right in the middle of um, covid and uh, that's been a long held desire. And so Rebecca Cruz.com is on the web and we're getting um, wonderful placements with celebrities wearing the clothing placements in films, as well as um, running a retail establishment. And um, every woman can come in and, you know, purchase the clothing and um, enjoy the, uh, the fashion styling. So Mrs. Cruz. So um, very gosh, whole lot of things. I also have kids who are actors. So I've also been a momager, as it were. My (laughs) older daughter, Azriel, is an actress in New York City. And my son, Isaiah, has also worked on television on Nickelodeon. And he's currently working for DreamWorks doing um, voiceover animation. And then I have another daughter in college who also wants to be a screenwriter. And another daughter in college for music. So all these artists in the family. So mommy's trying to help everyone fly the nest and live their dreams. So I, that's why I always say that I'm a mom first, you know. Mm. Um, so I do have businesses that I run. Um, the the eagles aren't all completely out of the nest. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I still have a big hand in what they do. And i um, very thankful to do that. Very thankful to push people into their dreams. Um, And trying to live my own as well. So um, trying to have that balance as a wife and mother. Mm. So for that reason, um, I pursued some of those things. Um, Probably lastly, one of the things I'm most proud of is that I'm also a minister. I'm an ordained minister. And 
my husband and I shared um, a memoir that was put out by Audible. Um, basically, it was our life story, but it included uh, some pits and failings that we went through. And basically, um, we shared with everyone how to and maybe why you can or should fight for your family and your marriage, even in the case of infidelity or addiction. And that um, through our faith, believing that um, that God can restore people. So um, we've done a lot with that. We actually did a whole <laughs> book tour talking about that subject. So uh, we've been a pretty open book, you know, uh, as a couple. And so um, we're thankful for that. We're thankful that um, something we fought through might be able to help other people. And honestly, Jay, that has been my heart from the time I was a little girl um, mm -hmm. to do something with my life that would impact others and be a service to humanity. Um, so that in a nutshell is who Rebecca is. Um, I wear a lot of hats, but my heart's desire is to bring goodness, bring light, bring faith, bring hope, encouragement to people through our media um, outreaches that we have. So, Well, can I just firstly say thank you for sharing all that and welcome so much to the Storybox podcast. I think we're going to have a wonderful conversation because you mentioned a lot. And uh -huh. one, of the, one of the things that I've been struck by with both yourself and even Terry, I've listened to a lot of the podcasts that Terry has been on. I even listened to one where you both were together and you both were talking about your marriage and what went on during a period of your marriage as well, which was, I was like, not many people would be open and honest and willing to actually go there and, and share the ins and outs of the failures and within a marriage and, and be so transparent with people. I think it was a Hillsong related podcast oh, yeah. that you, you yeah, both were on. Yeah, we did Lee show. Uh-huh. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I love that one. And that was, I think, the moment where I'm like, I want to have Rebecca on my show. <laughs> I'm like, that was, uh, I believe it was two years ago now? Or, or yeah, a year? two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was the moment where I'm, I've gone, I, I want to have a conversation and I want to hear Rebecca's story because it seems to be rather awestruck for myself. Um mm. So I guess I wanted to ask you this question is why be so vulnerable? Why be so transparent with your story and all the failures that you've you've had a journey through? I mean, Terry's been rather vulnerable in sharing and being open with addiction to pornography and infidelity and, and those sort of things. But why do that, especially with the platform that you both have? Um, well, let me say this. Um one of the platforms we have is social media, right? Social media allows us to be a little more vulnerable, a little more personable, let the public see the human side of celebrity, you know, because there is a mystique, right? There is a mystique to what you think people go through and what they live and how they live. And that that is a, um, a falsehood. You know, it is not a real picture of life, life in the Midwest or life in the fast lane. Mm. Uh, and so part of why we were, and I want to say it was really my husband first who wanted to be vulnerable. Mm. Uh, he was offered a book deal back in probably 2015, which was about five years after our breakup. Uh, and he sat me down. And he said, you know, honey, I really want to tell our story. Well, he said, I want to tell my story. Uh, and I said, wow, are you sure you're ready for that? You know, and he's like, I am. Because one of the hallmarks of addiction, overcoming addiction, is that you then lend yourself to reaching back and helping other people. And a big part of even keeping your sobriety is becoming going from a um, what's the right word? Victim's not a right word, but but going from the broken person 
to someone who has received a measure of healing. And there's something powerful in sharing your healing that gives other people hope, but it also that brings more healing for you. Uh -huh. um, I don't know how to explain that except to say that I believe there's a principle in the world of reaping and sowing and yeah. that as you do for others, you put in the ground a seed that comes up and becomes a harvest that comes back into your life that you eat from. And so I wasn't ready, honestly, when he wanted to go public with his situation, but he was. And I told him, it's your story. I'm a part of it, but it's really your story. And so you do whatever you feel is best. And so in manhood, he kind of cracked the egg a little bit and shared some of his trauma and then some of his addiction. And then people began to come to the internet with, what about Rebecca? Oh my God, I want to hear, how did she handle that? Yeah. And that is what begat the book Stronger Together. Uh, and so we were very privileged to have an opportunity to work with. And Audible was so amazing. There's, I've always wanted to be an author. I've always wanted to share things I've been through um, in my faith journey, in my life journey. So um, I'm very thankful that we had the opportunity to do that with Audible. And really, we, on, we only touched the surface in that book. Mm -hmm. We could probably write more books on that subject that would give people much more of a lay of the land sort of a map to walking out, you know, whatever they're probably going through right now, because so many couples are going through it. Um, we have a saying, you know, there's actually a group out. Um, they're called porn is the new drug. Mm -hmm. It's become so, so prevalent with our young people and our kids. And of course, with all the things going on with the trafficking, I mean, it's just astronomically awful what is happening in our culture with regards to the misuse of the gift of sex. Yeah. So we felt imperative. It was imperative for us to stand as a little bit of a beacon, waving the light going, listen, we got sucked in this, but we're not in it. We're not sucked in today. And we can at least encourage you. We're not professionals, but we could encourage you that we're, we're doing great. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's also a part of our, our faith message that that anything you went through or been through or have experienced can be used to comfort others with the same comfort that you received in your pain and in your journey. Um, and so I wouldn't be a faithful minister or gospel preacher to to hide all of our our sins and our shortcomings and our failures, because people look up to you and think you don't go through that. Yeah. And it's just not, it's just not real. And there's so much relief to find out that someone you may aspire to be like, or you may think, man, I wish I had their life. Well, mm -hmm. they have issues too. Having money doesn't solve every problem. In fact, it can create other problems. And, you know, as what's it, what's his name? Um, Big Eep said, more money, more problems. That <laughs> is true. And fame creates problems. It's a double-edged sword. It's a great tribute. It's a great honor to have recognition. But there's a backside to fame. Mm -hmm. And you have to take both. Um, but like I said, when, when we went public, it was purely, um, it was purely to just be a light of encouragement. Nothing more. You know, we didn't want to set ourselves out as experts by any means, but that we, and I still feel, um, porn and the whole industry that revolves around the sale of sex has done so much harm, yeah. so much harm to families, to kids. I, it, it's just really, it's an astronomical problem. Uh, and one that I believe we put our heads together, we can solve. Mm. You know, we abolished human slavery in the 1800s. We can abolish this. We can abolish these companies that profit uh, from the assault of women and kids. And I mean, you know, we can't even go how deep and dark it is. But from the stuff people call harmless to the deepest, darkest, all of it betrays our humanity and 
and casts us into a place of having a less than worthy um, perception of other people. And, and it's, um, it's just high time we look at it realistically and go, is this really benefiting us is it, or is it harming us? I think we can argue that it is. And um, so we hope to be part of that solution in whatever way we can. I've been incredibly encouraged by not just Terry speaking out, but also yourself speaking out and what you went through during that journey because you both, mm -hmm. it's your story just as much as it is his, but it also yeah. helped me realize that, hey, I'm not alone. There are people out there that may be in a much greater spotlight than I am that went through a dark period of addiction and I I could resonate a lot with both Terry's part of the story as much as even your side of the story as well, believe it or not, because mm. I struggled with porn addiction since I was 12 years old mm. and that addiction made me feel like I was trapped and it was an incredibly dark period of my life that yeah. taught me horrible things I and it affected my relationships it affected the relationship that I had with myself and the relationship that I had with God. And I, I tried to get away from it for such a long time. And the struggle was just immense. It was like this massive weight that was on my shoulders and I couldn't seem to get the weight off my shoulders. Mm -hmm. And the more I started listening to people that did struggle as well. And the more I started to, realize that, hey, I do need help. This is not good for me. I knew that I needed help, but I just didn't know how or where to get it. And the, the journey and the whole process of getting that kind of help was a challenge in of itself. And it does impact the family dynamics. It is a toxic element in society. And you are spot on with, if we can abolish slavery... If we can all put our heads together and say, well, trafficking is wrong. We know that it's wrong. Porn is wrong. We can do something about this. But the problem is like a lot of people, they profit from it. So the almighty dollar then becomes the, the focus. And as a result, all these young people are now suffering because of people that are evil, essentially. And so... It, it becomes this really hard dynamic to navigate through, doesn't it? Like I, I want people to be happy and healthy and, and live a good life, let, let's say that. But how yeah. can we when we've got this evil that is right at our doorstep that is so easy to access? Yeah, and it's not the doorstep. It's in your house. Yeah. You know, it's, I mean, imagine, I heard one gentleman say, imagine if, Liquor companies were allowed to pour alcohol through your water system for free. Mm. Right? Like, we're just giving it to you for free because we love you. And they were allowed to pump alcohol through the water system. How many people would be addicted? Right? If, if we were allowed, if they were, we were allowed to put, you know, whatever kind of drugs. I mean, I know marijuana is legal. I, I don't smoke weed. I don't advocate it. However, what if the marijuana companies were allowed to come into our high schools and give these kids weed, give these kids? I mean, we had to fight the vending companies with the sugar, right? Because they're putting the vending machines and the soda and childhood diabetes went through the roof, right? And so all of these people's financial agendas, right? They handled their patrons like a drug dealer. They put it, they made it easy to get, made it almost free. And then they hook you. Mm. Okay. And so porn is the same. Think about, you don't have to look for porn. Porn is popping up in your ad. It's popping up. It's, it's coming for you. Oh, yeah. Um, and I mean, I've dealt with this with all my kids. Every one of my kids went through a period of just kind of being cooked and feeling like they were struggling with not watching, you know, and I mean, and sex is, you know, a good thing, a human thing, but We've had such a um, a twisting and turning of the purpose and the meaning of it that uh, it destroys a healthy 
relationship. It destroys, um, really, it actually destroys your ability to enjoy mm. intimacy because you've had this perception seeded into your mind that's not healthy or it's not realistic or it's um, it's based on a male or even a female uh, fantasy or hierarchy that is not based in true life. So there are so many ways that it harms us, not to mention it can turn victims into perpetrators, okay? Because there's a Bible verse that I've always believed in. It said that lust is never satisfied. Mm. And so that when we, if we are ever held captive by lust, which is different than love and attraction. Lust at its core is self-centered, self-fulfilling, and self-seeking. And when you operate from lust, you're going to use people, abuse people, mistreat people, put them on camera. You know, there's a demoralizing aspect of this culture, uh, rape culture. You know, it all bleeds together and people go, well, you can't say everyone. Well, no, maybe not everyone, but you are opening a gate. You're opening a gate to some, to really a demon of sorts. Oh, yeah. That can take you darker, farther than you want to go. And I guarantee you people sitting in prison today for child molestation, trafficking, rape, when they were little boys, that's not what they wanted to be. You know, that's not what they wanted to be. Somebody injected, someone inserted that that thought process and that 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 mindset mm. that went unchecked and became like a tree. So the seed grew into a tree with all this horrible bad fruit hanging off of it. And sexual assault and so assault of minors, of women, children, even grandmas. There, there are people in prison for raping a 90-something-year-old woman. Like, that's not about attraction. That's about evil, you know? So to that end, um, and I do want to say this, they're female perpetrators. So I'm not trying to just get on the men because many women are victimized and become perpetrators as well. So the cycle is broken through a direct line, in my opinion, to God, who is the resetter of our our um, our matrix, so to speak. And that is why the 12 steps mm. uh, includes a divine connection, because there's a reality that somehow we can't quite get over this on our own, because if we could, we would have, right? Yeah. If just our will and just our, you know, uh, white knuckling could have brought us that kind of um, brought us to a place of being free, we wouldn't have addiction centers. We wouldn't have, you know, and sadly, the porn uh, industry has become so, um, I don't know, famous for what it's not doing. In other words, not regulating itself. You know, I don't even agree necessarily with the kind of porn that where everybody's a willing subject and everybody's in this, to, you know, I'm not even a fan in that sense. But how much more you're dealing with victimization, people who are railroaded, people who are forced into things, intimidated, given drugs, you know, there, there's an element of slavery even there. Uh, so, so to put it mildly, I think the whole can of worms needs to just go goodbye. Yeah. You know, I don't personally believe there's good porn. Okay, that's just me. There, there are psychologists who would argue with me, but I don't believe there's good porn. Okay. Now, to that end, the minimal that we should be doing is protecting people against violation. Mm. Okay, minimal. Thus, these companies should not be distributing videos of assaults. Uh, you know, I mean, that's just a bare minimum. That's a bare minimum. Yeah. You know, that, that you can't, you know, videotape someone being a, I mean, come on. Like, how, how, do, how are they getting away with that? Yeah. You know, they're, 
there are people, there are victims outside their buildings marching saying, this is not right. I have the police report. I have everything. And they're still broadcasting, making money off my assault. I mean, it, you know, how in the world did we get to this place? You know, in the name of free speech, in the name of entertainment, we're, we're looking the other way and co-signing horribly, horribly criminal activity. Criminal. Yeah. So these people want to wave a flag and talk about we're free. Well, maybe you are, but not everyone else is. Yeah. It's on a utopia uh, for them. Yeah. And, and so, um, you know, one of the things, too, that I want to say is that in the porn industry, um, for example, with alcohol, we have an acknowledgement that alcohol can be dangerous. We have an acknowledgement of addiction. So at least the alcohol, you know, businesses have to say things like drink responsibly, don't drink and drive. They at least are acknowledging this product that we are you know, selling has a capacity to do some things to you that might not be good for you. Yeah. So drink at your own risk. I mean, minimally, right? They're accountable and they know it. With porn, we have no such thing. We have no accountability for these companies. We have no responsibilities that are being placed on them to warn the public about what can go wrong with consuming our product. Yeah. Okay. Um, and not to mention, again, all the possibilities of, like I said, rape, incest, even murder. I mean, God forbid, you know, things that are going on that are like, why in the world are we standing here letting this happen? Yeah. <clears throat> and then on the flip side, the porn industry does not want to acknowledge the addictive quality. And in some ways, I remember when my husband was um, ad advised by a therapist to seek treatment. It was such a shock to us that there were all these cottage industry places for this issue that no one really promotes. You know, we all know about the Betty Ford Clinic. Right. We know about drug addiction and rehab and but no one is out there waving a flag to porn addicted people. Hey, we have help over here. And I would love to see that. I would love to see this um, conscionable effort to to wave this flag and say, we have people here who have been addicted, messed up their lives and have shifted their whole identity around this addiction that we are now seeing them move away from that and have a better existence because of the help we provided, right? And it's a very similar model to what is used with alcohol or drugs. Yeah. And so to that, I want to say that I would love for there to be more effort put forth to say, hey, let's do a billboard. You're addicted to porn, you can call this number. You can go to this place. Because these agencies have existed for years, mm -hmm. for years. But they're like a dirty little secret. And um, the place we went is called um, PCS, and they're in Scottsdale, Arizona. Yep. And man, they handled everything. They handled preachers, they handled politicians, stars, act, everybody. And they were so good because they did not care who you were. They were there to help you get set free. And that's exactly mm -hmm. how they treated us. Um, and it was awesome. It was, and, and, you know, of course they go to the heart of your trauma to, cause we know addi what addiction is. Addiction is a way to deal with pain. Yeah. Okay. It's a way to hide and deal with our pain. So we're going in and digging out the roots and pulling up the stumps and, pulling out the aches and the pains of our past and letting the tears fall. I watched my husband. I watched him cry for the first time in 20 years, Jay. I lost children. I've had three miscarriages in our marriage, one at six months in my pregnancy. 
my husband didn't cry because he was so bottled and hardened from all his trauma. And he was hard to live with. I didn't know what was going on with him. I just thought he was mean. You know, I was like, why are you such a grump? You know, <laughs> but he cried for the first time and he cried and cried and cried. I would say for almost two years, my husband would just cry and he'd come in off watching something and he'd say, honey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I mean, true repentance, true brokenness, you know. And that's why God said, work with him, Becky, fight with him. Because this is this is for all of you. You know, this family needs you and they need him. And um, and I'm not saying that everybody needs to work it out. Because had there been unwillingness, okay, I would have made a different decision. Yeah. But I'm thankful that he made a choice in his moment of despair to look up. Not to just say, oh, the hell with it. And just because people do. And they go down the road and go, why did I do that? Why did I not fight for my family? You know, um, so I'm lucky. I'm lucky. I, cause it, you know, I'm, I'm like the last wolf standing. Like I have so many people in my circle aren't with their partners anymore. Mm. And so I feel lucky and I feel blessed. Um, but but in this, we went through our excavation. He went through his, and there was so much. There was so much, Jay, that though he had shared his upbringing, I had no idea, you know, how much pain he really had inside himself and how many thought processes and, and emotional issues. I was shocked. And um, long story short, um, he, he, you know, he wasn't a perfect husband in his, in his, you know, addiction and re recovery and apologies. We still had fights in the middle. There were, listen, Jay, there were so many times that I had bags packed. Like if he says one more daggone thing to me, I'm just moving out. Like I had a lot of those days. So I don't want to give anybody here the impression that I just sat there with my hands folded and prayed for my husband every day. I hated him. I threw things at him. Uh, I'm not a fighter. I've never been in physical fights except with my little brother. But I let every emotion out of myself. I screamed and I raged. I threw things. You know, I, I'm, and more than one occasion, I told him, I'm done. You know, you're just, you're not, you're stupid. You're not committing to this. You know, you're not doing enough. And he would just say, I'm doing the best I can, is what he would say. And I would like, well, I don't think you are, <laughs> you know. So I don't want to give the impression that it was this seamless, like, like worshipful. Oh, we're so happy. Hallelujah. It was hard. It was bitter. But I couldn't. For me, I said, what if I jump ship here? What will I say 10 years from now that I should have done? You see me? You see what I mean? For me, it was worthy of me to try, to try. And then, of course, Everybody has their breaking point. Everybody has their own, you know, Maya culpa, their own place of defeat where like I give, you know, I'm just not worthy of this. I can't tolerate this. I don't love you no more. I'm over it. I'm done. I have never seen. There's a scripture that says I have been young and I'm now old. And I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging bread. 
there was something about it that was calling me, if I can say it that way. I felt a sense of determination to be that person who fought tooth and nail and stayed the course as much as I wanted to have revenge. I didn't believe that was my answer or the key to my future happiness. Because when I sat and played out the whole scenario, I didn't like the alternate universe. Mm. I just, I just, okay, so we break up and we go marry other people. I, I just kept picturing that movie, like the way we were, you know, Barbara Streisand and mm-hmm. Robert Redford and that little look of what could have been. Yeah. And so I hung in there. And um, we're at 34 years. So, um, you know, I'm sure a lot of women, you know, and I've I've seen the comments, you know, because we've done other shows besides Natalie's show. Uh, I've seen the comments where people are like, Psh, I wouldn't have done this and that and that. Well, I wouldn't have either if he had been different. Yeah. But he held the key. And as he did, what he felt was his best effort. I couldn't deny the 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 symptoms of the addiction were shifting. He was sweeter. He was more patient. He was not screaming at the kids. He was kinder. He was more focused on being a family man than just being like this worker bee and everything is, you know, go, go, go. Now, I'm not saying he's still not a little bit of a worker bee, but there's a much better um, familial structure and 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 uh, a lack of um, strife, you know. Um, and then we're at a crossroads now because our kids are leaving home. Mm-hmm. So we're going back to the counselor going, what's this next phase? How do we manage what we both expect from each other? You know, and that and that's a crossroads too. Mm. So um, I'm proud to say that I'm in a position of life that um, I can be secured by someone who genuinely fought to save this relationship. He fought to save it. You know, he didn't go somewhere and cry and beg and not do anything he went to bat to deal with his self and dealing with his self affected the way he handled everything how do you know when it's more a choice to fight for something that you want versus knowing when to let go well and that's you know that's a very specific um, drama for each person. Um, I tell the story that as I was uncovering his secrets, um, you know, and this was for for us, it was more of like this denouement. You know, it's like we've had all these arguments and fights. And I felt like the spirit of the Lord was upon me and was telling me things and saying, ask him this ask him that so like god was selling on him okay mm. and he and at the same time god was pressing down on his conscience saying you better tell her you better tell her so as that happened um he just blurted it out and came clean so i didn't catch him or anything like that you know he he came clean and immediately i heard what I believe was the voice of my father in heaven say, throw him out, throw him out. And I went, okay. And I did. And that consequence, I believe, was like a cold slap in the face for him. I think that he didn't think I would leave. Mm -hmm. And that put him in a bit of a pit, you know, like I recall in the subsequent weeks, him just falling apart. Like I had never seen that, you know. And the the I guess um 
as there was a change of heart for him, I felt like something in me saying, now there's a chance. Like as my husband became more repentant, then the Holy Spirit started to tell me, now he's he's open, he's malleable, he's plot, he's will it, you know, there's something there. So give him a shot, give him a shot. And I did not demand that he do ABC. I didn't demand. I was actually a little bit incredulous when the the doctor said, I think you have a sex addiction. You need to go over here. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what? Sex is it? Like I had the denial, you know, and he took time off and 10 days he went, he went, um, it's not quite inpatient. It's what they call outpatient intensive. So he got a hotel and did basically 56 hours. So one week or 10 days. No, so 10 days times 200, whatever, you know, 10 days, eight hours a day. And he came home and I didn't recognize him. You know, I, I can honestly say, I'm sure I bullied him a little bit. You know, I was like, oh, so now you think you're enlightened and blah, blah, blah. And he would just say, just give me a minute, Becky. And he would plead with me. You know, he'd go, don't give up on me, please. Give me a minute. Um, he said, you know, we could work this out. And he did. He bet he practically chased me around, like he like spiritually. Everywhere I would go, people would total strangers, Jay, would come up to me and go, You got a good man there, Rebecca. Don't you leave your husband. And I was like, how does this lady know? <laughs> I'm thinking about leaving my husband. You know, nobody knew. Nobody knew. I tell an infamous story in one interview how um, a car salesman and I were chatting because I was looking for a new car because I was going to move. Actually, while we were on the East Coast, I was going to come back here by myself because I was up for like a talk kind of talk thing with Oprah's network. Mm. And I had my, I'm like, I'm going to get my car. I'm going to get my apartment. I'm going to live by myself. You know, I'll show him, you know, none of it worked out. And then the car salesman, all he could talk about was his first marriage failed and why he regretted it. And he said, if you got a man who's willing to go to the counseling and this and that, I didn't say, oh, can I tell you? It was like he was sent by the Holy Spirit. And it just, it just felt like God was like hemming me in. Like, Rebecca, do not, do not leave this guy. Don't like, like, I remember I would drive past the fire station and that little sign, don't leave your baby. I'd see it everywhere. Don't leave your baby. I was like, Ugh. I'd be like, leave me alone, Jesus. And, but he was saying, no, I see what this, husband will become and you can handle it and I did so I I don't say that I'm a strong person I say I have a strong Jesus Mm -hmm. because you know there's a scripture that says a threefold cord is not easily broken well I was that little skinny string with no strength Terry was similar But Jesus was the strong cord. And he came between us and twined us together and twined us to himself. And we swung through the storm over the alligators, (laughs) screaming all the way to the other side. And I had many people who helped, counselors, pastors, our, our dear, dear friends, Jim and Marguerite Reeve from Faith Community Church, held us together. You know, I called her many, many, (laughs) many times. She needs, she needs, she deserves a degree, right? In marital therapy, Uh, a PhD, you know, PhD stands for pretty hard days, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Good. And my girlfriend, you know, my bestie from college, Muriel, she and I would pray and we'd share. I had resources online. I had books, tapes, 
products from, um, what is it? Um, I want to say it's Mark and Desiree Ayers, who also have a ministry with addiction to um, sex and porn. Uh, everyone say, and then that's when I realized, oh my gosh, there are people like, this is a thing. Like there's an industry for this. And I went, why isn't this out more? Like, why are we not promulgating the securing of our marriages? Yeah. You know, we're promulgating getting rid of people. Get rid of them. Get rid. You know, throw people. You know, everything you see is throw people out. Get rid of people. But Jesus is called Savior. He wants us to heal and restore. It's, it's like saying you nicked, you nicked your car, so you're going to throw away the whole car. No, you fix the car. Even if you total the car, you get another car. You, you don't quit. You don't. I'm never going to drive again because I dinged my car, but we throw away our spouses, you know, and I think we should do better. I do. Again, sometimes, again, sometimes the person. And, and, you know, and I've even seen this happen, Jay, the family breaks up. The, the husband goes on and has however many more women. And somewhere down the road, maybe in his 70s, 80s, he kind of comes to himself and goes, man, I really like screwed up my life. I broke my children's hearts. I broke my. Fr-. And and because it took them that long to get to that place. It's not impossible. But. Many times, the only person who benefits from your your now kind of broken change of heart and mind might be those people who are in your life at the moment, right? But the people you wounded, they're kind of just left, you know? Um, And that's why a big part of the 12th step is to make amends, to write a letter, to speak to people you've wounded and ask their forgiveness, that's so biblical. It's so true. And it's so much a part of the healing um, that I want to say that that was also a very major reason that I hung in there because there were so many places my husband just said, I, I, I have to fix, you know, he called his kids. He called me. He talked, you know, he he made appointments with people that he needed to say he was sorry to. Um. So, is it perfect? No. But I'm glad that we did um, go through what we went through and that we're here together. I think sometimes some people believe that the grass is greener on the other side. It's so much easier to be done away with the challenge that it, the person's going through. They run away from it. They don't want to stand up to it. And they just go to something new. And then what they're really doing is just creating more problem and more hassle. They're not dealing with the thing that they really need to deal with in that moment. But how did you... You also find that you have the same problems in the new relationship. Oh, yeah. It just carries over. Yeah, you bring yourself to the relationship. So new wife, new husband, you're you're just repeating. You know, and that's... I heard one famous entertainer, I want to say, I think it was Roseanne Barr, who was like Mm -hmm. uh, her 60s, lamenting that she ruined her first marriage. And she said, you know, my kids could have had their father. And I just went through the same dumb stuff with each husband afterward, after him, after that, you know. And life will show you in hindsight. But the Bible teaches us you don't have to just learn the hard way. Wisdom is a teacher. Wisdom mm. is people have been through this before. This is what they learned. So use that and don't go down the same path. And 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 so that's what we are. We're trying to save wisdom. We we went down it and you know, help is on the way if you want to be helped, you know. Um, so it's an important part of who we are. Yeah. You know? 
doesn't the Bible give us foresight? But we reject the foresight and then we end up going to hindsight, which is interesting. Like when we could have just had the foresight, which is actual wisdom, take that on board and not have to go through all the muck. But alas, we are human. Well, well, but often depending on the subject matter, we Mm. are willing to hear wisdom. You see what I mean? There are parts of our lives that we have taken the wisdom of other people and professionals or maybe friends, family that we have done well in. But in that area that we are stubborn or foolish, as the scripture says, a fool plods on, you know, a wise, it says a wise man will hear and increase learning, but a fool plods on to his own destruction. Mm. So are we the fool or the wise man? You know, my husband loves to talk about how in every man, there's a fool, there's a victim, and there's a king. Yeah. The fool does the stupid stuff everybody tells him not to do. Then he messes his life up. Now he's the victim. Why me? Why me? When in reality, the king takes responsibility for their life. And a king accepts responsibility, goes on to make the world around him a better place. And beginning with himself. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I, I I don't believe we have to learn the hard way. Um, but if you do, learn it, you know. Do, uh, if you're learn in the well. pit, <laughs> come on out and do, don't even go down the street where the pit is, you know. Just go a whole other way with your life, and 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 that and and that's real, you know. Even the the intensity and the draconian nature of, you know, cut off your arm if it causes you to sin. Mm-hmm. Cut off the friends if they take you the wrong way. Cut off, you know, whatever you you need to be free. You know, it it demands that. It demands that kind of sacrifice uh, if you want it, if you want it. And and we all want things, but the way we know what we really want is what are we willing to do to have it? Oh, yeah. And right? that willingness, that ability to go, I, I know what I need to do. Now I need to grip my teeth and bear it for such a time as this. And get to the other side because it's Absolutely. far more worthwhile to get to the other side where it's a lot freer and you've learned what you've need needed to learn during that period of time than running away from it and causing yourself more harm and more damage. Because either way, running away from it is and is gonna end up being far worse for yourself than running through it or towards it and getting to the other side of it. But and also, too, we have to think of the benefits of freedom, mm. um, the benefit. You know, the Bible said that Jesus, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What was the joy set before Jesus? It was us. Mm. It was the church. It was the believers. It was those who would come and believe on him. He had to endure his hardship by seeing the end result. If you could see the freedom the happiness, the joy that you have on the other side of addiction. And and that's sometimes what life gives you. That's what rehab can give you. It can give you a picture of, oh, I can be happy. I could like enjoy my life without all of this. Wow. I I couldn't even fathom that. And and so it's enlarging our vision, enlarging our capacity and our, our ability. And that's a gift. I believe that's a gift. That, that, that life grants us opportunities to go higher by bringing us that epiphany of, wow, that's possible. That's possible for me. Um, and that's to me what God is with, because he's the one that can do impossible things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, um, I don't know. I mean, I hope that that's encouraging to your listeners because Um, it can be so easy to sit in our pot of stew and just think nothing will ever change. Yeah. You know, oh, I'm here, I'm this, I'm that. I'll never be 
debt free. I'll never be. No, go talk to some people, go read, go watch, go learn. But there are people who've overcome what you're dealing with. And then it changes your perspective and your vision. And you like, oh, now I have hope. And hope makes not a shame. And now with my hope, I can take the steps to be there and live this life that, you know, maybe years before I thought was impossible for me. Create some action. So much better. How did you learn how to trust Terry again? And how did you, yeah. How did I learn? I watched him. Um, I saw differences in his behavior. I did sometimes follow him. Uh, I did sometimes track him. Uh, I even had a, um, a therapist say, you have every right to search probe. And if he gaslights you about it, then that tells you he's whether he's in the wrong. Mm. My husband allowed me to have access to his computer. Um, I knew his passwords on all his, you know, every everything he had. Um, he even put some, um, what do you call that? Um, I think it was called Covenant Eyes. Oh, yeah, 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 we have that. Hardware on his phone. Yeah. That would send me the pages he went to. So he allowed there to be accountability. And I even, uh, I would even say that whatever you have, to, and he would say to me, you know, walk around the house, whatever you need to do. You can want to look at my phone. You can look at my, like, he did his best to not be secretive about anything. Mm. And then... There was one occasion that I actually paid um, for, for a lie detector just to say, all right, let's see if we could verify that everything you have told me up to this point is real. And not only was it a success, but the guy who came and did the testing, who worked for the FBI and the NYPD, turned out that he was a Christian. I didn't even know this. And he sat me down, he handed me the envelope. He said, he said, you're, I believe your husband's telling you the truth, Mrs. Cruz. And I'm like, what? Now I really, I'm gonna be honest, I thought he was gonna fail it, okay? Cause that's just how negative and fearful I was after all this. Mm -hmm. And I went, what? He said, he said, he passed. He said, but not only did he pass, he said, I've been doing this a long time and I know when people are not honest. He said, I see in your man a great potential to, be, to do great things. And he said, when a man wants to and he can, you know, focus himself, he'll, he'll overcome anything. And this is a man who sits with criminals and mafia and, uh, you know, and I, and I just like couldn't believe it. Like I, I rode home. From because I dropped, I took the man back to his train, you know. And I go up to Terry and I go, You passed. And he just fell down on his knees crying. He's like, I told you, I told you. <laughs> I, he's like, You put me through it. Oh my God, I was scared. It would give me a false positive or something. And he just was upset. I said, Honey, I, I apologize, but I had to. And he's like, I know, I know. I mean, it was a breakthrough. For both of us, you know, because you just be paranoid. You know, you can just live in paranoia. So you actually have to get empirical evidence. So I, I say to people, if you have to follow or put the tracker on the phone, and they should be willing to. If they're not willing to, that tells you something. Mm. Okay. Uh, that tells you about their willingness. Because if they really want to save the marriage and they really want to you know, cut off their ties to everything and then they're going to be transparent. Um, so, yeah, tr and trust is earned. I mean, trust is not instant. And though forgiveness is a choice, forgiveness isn't instant because though you make the decision, OK, I'm going to give it a shot. There's the process of believing in them again, like you said, and then there's the process of believing in yourself because you think, how did I not know? for all this time that was going on. Well, you know, 
almost didn't know. I mean, I can remember a couple of times us talking about porn, but not knowing the extent, mm. you know. And uh, and so you you can feel a little hoodwinked. So you almost have to put your thinking cap back on and go, okay, empirical evidence, not just a gut feeling, because gut feelings are part of it. You have gut feelings when people are doing something sideways. You as the spouse, you you pick that up. But I just had to go with my gut, but also with, do I have proof? And so wherever I could, I pursued that proof. And eventually I just had to conclude I haven't, you know, I haven't caught him at anything in the last however period of time and I can't follow him forever. So I have to just live with him and believe he's doing the right thing until something shows me otherwise. And, and so that's what we have. And every so often, if I get a little feeling, who is that? Who is, you know, he'll go, oh, that's, he's, he'll explain, oh, that's so-and-so. And they work with, they work with the show and this and that. And, and I mean, this is literally just like business talk. You know, it's not like, hey, baby, in the text. Mm. But even if it's just business talk, I'm like, hmm, this person's in your phone a lot. What's going on? You know? So, and and I have the right to be, you know, so. Um, but, yeah, there's not like a chronic for me. There's not a chronic kind of suspicion or jealousy that I live under. Um, and I never was that that way. So um, for me, it was odd to be fearful and jealous and worried. And I was like, oh, my gosh, you know, I don't know who you are anymore, you know. Um, and, and that was hard. That I mean, that probably took me at least, I'm going to be honest, it probably took me about four, four or five years before I stopped thinking another shoe was going to fall, mm. you know. And I've heard people say it took longer than that for them. And I've heard people say it was shorter. Yeah. So probably there are some processes you can do together that can build that faster. But my husband was an actor. He worked away from home a lot, you know, so that... You know, careers like that lend themselves to distrust. So, um, yeah. Rebecca, I know that you've given me so much of your time already. Oh, it's okay. So vulnerable. I would love to have another conversation with you oh, uh, sure. at, a, at a later date. I wanted to ask you sort of in closing, what do you love the most about yourself and your story? Mm. <laughs> that's probably the hardest question anybody's ever asked me what I love most about myself um, I have issues with myself to be honest I think I'm a little uh, insecure and a little bit you know fighting for my place in life still you know um, what I love about my story I would say is that me and Jesus have done it together that is for me is what I consider my greatest um, strength is that for whatever reason I found him or he found me and we have walked together through a lot and that my grace that I carry um, is, is, um, is a part of who I am, but it's be it's a part it's, it's a part of my life that is credited to the Lord. Um, loving about myself, I don't know. Um, I think I'm a bit of a fighter. I think I have a strong um, personal determination to succeed um, and succeed in my way, succeed in relationships, succeed in faithfulness. Um, and that part of me, I think has, has allowed me to overcome a lot of challenges and, um, to be where I am today. And there's a whole lot about me. People don't know. I have a, this whole history of sexual and physical abuse as a young person that I don't even talk about a lot because I was so delivered and healed when I came into Christ as a teenager that I didn't even talk about the mess I went through with my stepdad and my family. And I don't talk about it much now, but, uh, but it was a great 
um, deliverance and a great freedom in, in a part of my life that had I not let Jesus in would have probably taken me down a really terrible road and would not have allowed me to experience the life I have today. So I thank God for Jesus because he taught me to forgive. He taught me to forgive my past and my my hurts from, you know, the people that molested me or the teachers that were hurtful or um, various aspects of life that I experienced that tried to take away my, my self-worth. Um, but God saw fit to to raise me and keep me. And I feel gratitude in that. I feel great gratitude. Well, I am grateful. I really am for you and your story. And to be honest with you, there's so much more that I, I really do want to ask you. There's the whole cancer journey that you've been on as well. Okay. Being a cancer survivor, there's yes. your career as well. But I feel like God navigated this conversation where we needed to go. Uh, I would love to have another conversation with you. Um, so we can please make that happen. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And forgive me. I always say, don't ask a preacher a question because she's going to give you a whole message. Uh, I know we, you know, often people, we like to hop around quite a bit in interviews. Um, so I'm perfectly happy to sit with you again, Jay. Um, and I'll try to uh, keep it to a minimum. No, no. I, I love it when people actually talk and they are willing to actually talk and, and share as much as they are sharing. Like, I mean, it's a lot better for me because it means I don't have to talk. <laughs> I get to listen and I get to learn. And so does my audience. And that's why I wanted to have you on here is to have that conversation with you. And I am grateful once again for your time. So thank you so much, Rebecca, for joining me today on the Storybox podcast. My extreme pleasure, Jay. Thank you so much.